When I was younger, I wanted to be a spy. But in many ways, I think being a scientist is like being a spy. I mean, I'm obtaining secret information just instead of from governments or criminal organisations, from cells, which can sort of be thought of as containing secret information because we need special tools to detect their signals. This is not a trivial thing to do, and on my quest through science, I'm always keen to learn how to become more intelligent, which is what we're going to talk about in this video. And the emphasis is on the word more, as we already are intelligent. But as I will share in this video, there are some very simple things you can do to appear even more intelligent. As earlier this year, I read the book How Spies Think, 10 Lessons in Intelligence. This book is written by Sir David Omand, former director of GCHQ, the government communications headquarters here in the UK, who intercepts communications and gather digital intelligence. In How Spies Think, David shares the methodology used by British intelligence agencies to reach judgments, establish the right level of confidence, and act decisively. As David explains, the more we understand about the decisions we have to take, the less likely it is we will duck them, make bad choices, or be seriously surprised. Much of what we need can come from sources that are open to anyone, provided sufficient care is taken to apply critical reasoning to them. So David offers this book his lessons from the world of secret intelligence. As he's learnt the hard way that intelligence is uh, difficult to come by, and is always fragmentary and incomplete, and is sometimes wrong. But used consistently, and of understanding of its limitations, it can shift the odds in the nation's favour, or in your favour. And this couldn't be more important to understand now than ever in our... Well, we are being overwhelmed with information from social media and other digital sources all the time, but are we more or less ignorant with this additional information? Um, well, I'm not going to answer that because I didn't have an answer. But why I think time is better spent is learning how to navigate with this increased information inflow and how to distinguish the facts from the fiction, the jokes from the, um, <laughs> anyway, and how to make better decisions. Now, there are 10 official lessons in David's book, but having given it some thought and intelligence of my own, I think they can be summarised into, into about six lessons. The first four of which are summarised by the C's model, and the C's model lays the foundation for the lessons. So the first S stands for situational awareness of what is happening and what we face now. E for explanation of why we are seeing what we do and underlying motivations. Often our weaknesses come from misunderstanding others, their motives, upbringing, culture and backgrounds. The second E is for estimates and forecasts of how events may unfold. And then the second S is for cheeky science, obviously. Um, I am joking, it's for strategic notice of further issues that may be a challenge in the longer term. So that's the model now for the lessons. Lesson one, situational awareness. Our knowledge of the world is always fragmentary and incomplete and is sometimes wrong. And so given that the information is limiting and may be wrong, at best, we can generate hypotheses about the world around us and how to act and use that to guide our decisions. We are often given a lot of new information, of which we then have to decide what to do with this new information to update our degree of belief. The way David suggests we go about this is through the use of Bayesian inference. So yes, as indicated by the equation, Bayesian inference is a method of statistical inference used to update the probability for a hypothesis as more evidence or information becomes available. So what this equation shows is when h equals hypothesis and e equals evidence, the probability for my hypothesis given the new evidence equals the probability of the hypothesis prior to the evidence multiplied by the probability of the evidence given the prior hypothesis divided by the probability of the evidence. Now, because that probably didn't make much sense if you're unfamiliar with Bayesian inference, there'll be an example later where we use it. But obviously, we're not going to be sitting down and doing some maths every time we make a decision. 
But I think it's useful to have it as a sort of framework as to how we are rationalizing this new information. So once you have the facts, the facts need explaining, and that's lesson number two. The bottom line here is that context is needed to infer meaning. The same facts can have opposite interpretations. David tells this fun story that he had from another guy, Bertrand Russell, known as the chicken espionage story. Imagine a chicken farm in which the chickens conduct an espionage operation on the farmer, perhaps by hacking into his computer. They discover that he is ordering large quantities of chicken food. The Joint Intelligence Committee of Chickens meet. What do they conclude? Is it that the farmer has finally recognised that they deserve more foods, or that they are being fattened up for the kill? Perhaps if the experience of the chickens has been of a happy outdoor life, then their past experience may lead them to be unable to conceive of the economics of chicken farming as seen by the farmer. On the other hand, chickens kept in their thousands in a large tin shed may well be all too ready to attribute the worst motives to the farmer. It is the same secret intelligence, the same fact, but with two opposite interpretations. This is true of most factual information. Another example involves the use of our Bayesian inference calculation. It's an interaction David had with Tony Blair. And so in this interaction, Tony Blair correctly guessed that David's background was in defence. And when David asked Tony Blair why, he replied that it was because his shoes were shined. Those used to working with the military had retained the habit of cleaning their shoes regularly. And so you can use Bayesian reasoning to test the hypothesis. Where this time the hypothesis H is D for defence, and the evidence is still the evidence, but the evidence is that the shoes are shined. So we can work out the probability that David works in defence, given the fact he has shiny shoes, equals the probability of people who are in defence multiplied by the probability of having shiny shoes, given that they work in defence, divided by the probability of people having shiny shoes. So this table shows the numbers for each of these probabilities. And so by looking at the table, we can see that by using Bayesian reasoning, the chances of Tony Blair's hypothesis being true is almost double what would be expected from a random guess. And that's because the number of people who work in defence is 100 out of 2,000, so 1 20th. Whilst assuming that his shiny shoes indicates that he's more likely to come from defence, he can reduce that probability down to 1 12th. 70 over 830. You can pause and check the numbers should you wish. Now, Tony clearly didn't go whip out his calculator when he said this to David. Well, I mean, I wasn't there, so I don't actually know, but I don't think he did. My impression is that we should just be using Bayesian inference as more of a framework to just make rational decisions. But what both of these stories, the one with Tony Blair and the chickens, tell is the importance of context and explanations. And the thing is, this actually raises interesting cautions for artificial intelligence in decision making and the dangers of letting a machine infer an explanation of what is occurring, especially if it doesn't have the context. But anyway, given that there is often multiple explanations for a given fact, how do we know which one to choose? The one with the most evidence for it, right? Wrong. As a general rule, it is the explanatory hypothesis with the least evidence against it that is the most likely to be the best one for us to adopt. This is a very simple fact, I think, at least I do, easily forget. In fact, it's really important for science to avoid the inductive fallacy trap of thinking that being able to collect more and more evidence in favour of our proposition necessarily increases confidence in it. By choosing the hypothesis that has the least evidence against it, you avoid the bias that could come from unconsciously choosing evidence to collect that is likely to support a favoured hypothesis. Similarly, I tweeted out a quote from this book that when there are more reports in favour of hypothesis A than its inverse hypothesis B, it is not always sensible to prefer A to B if we suspect that the amount of evidence pointing to A rather than B has been affected by how we set about searching for it. So science research, or just your daily life, understanding of facts should revolve around proving things wrong. 
<laughs> which is a funny thing to say. But speaking of human cognitive biases, this leads us on to actually the lessons from lesson five that I'm just going to throw into this section anyway. And that's the very human tendency to search for or interpret information in a way that confirms one's preconception, confirmation bias. We're quick to scrutinise information that contradicts our beliefs and quick to accept information that supports it. These illusions are not just necessarily at the individual level, but can also work at the group level or institutional level where they can have even more significant impacts. So what can you do? Well, we have to accept that complete objective analysis is impossible because we're human and we have to interpret reality for ourselves. But we can try to be as independent, honest and neutral in our analytic judgments as we can. So lesson three, estimations. Predictions need an explanatory model as well as sufficient data. Someone who is intelligent is often correct, their prediction was right. So how do you go about making better predictions? Well, assuming you followed the first two lessons, then you should be in a good position to follow the hypothesis that is most likely to be correct. But it is not that straightforward when it comes to estimations. This is because it is not just about the likelihood or the probability, but the expected value of the prediction. Expected value is the probability of an event multiplied by the measure of the consequences for you of it happening. For example, maybe I was wondering whether I should bring a coat to work, and for me that depends on if it's raining, so I can work out a probability of it raining. If I'm healthy and well, then I'll be pretty tolerant if it decides to rain and I don't have a coat, but if I was ill, it might not be great for me to be out in the rain. And therefore, despite having the same probability, whether or not it rains, my expected value differs. I'd be more likely to take the coat if I was ill. Now, that's a very obvious example that I feel like it's just common sense, but you can apply the same rationale to other decisions you make. The other thing that's worth pointing out is the fact that we are also limited by how far we can actually estimate in advance. The classic example here being predicting the weather. I sometimes don't even trust weather forecasts hours beforehand. And that's because there comes a point where even the smallest disturbances set in a train of sequence of cascading changes that can tip weather systems, or just facts in general. So now to lesson four, strategic notice. Essentially, knowing what to do in the event that shit does happen. And in doing so, we don't have to be so surprised by surprises. So essentially, strategic notice is preparing for what's coming, spotting opportunities as well as identifying dangers. Now, applying this in practice doesn't seem trivial, but from my perspective, it seems to be more about being conscientious with your information intake. It requires active processing. But in another sense, this lesson mainly just feels like a fancy way of saying, be prepared. So lesson five, though in the book it's lesson eight, imagine yourself in the shoes of the person on the other side. The case study here is negotiations. I recently watched an interview with Chris Voss on the Diary of a CEO podcast, which talks about how to negotiate and how you should ultimately let them discover the best deal. But what does David suggest and what is the best deal to take in a negotiation? Well, Preparation again is key, as according to David, it is always better psychologically to be prepared to advance to a known position than to retreat into the unknown during a negotiation. So for a negotiation, it is best to establish a BATNA first, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Work out what would be the best alternative should the negotiation go bad, since you have confidence that you already have your own route ready. It's easier to walk away from a negotiation in trouble when the alternative way ahead has previously been established. And then in terms of the negotiation itself, it's important to have the understanding of why both parties have come to the negotiation table and therefore what they will need to take away from the negotiation for it to count as a success. And so that's why you need to imagine yourself in the shoes of the person on the other side and understand their motivations, their cultural backgrounds, as as we saw these cognitive and confirmation biases, it's very likely to differ from what you might be thinking. And then the final lesson, lesson six, though lesson 10, 
is that subversion and sedition are now digital. The worlds of defence, security and intelligence now enter our daily lives directly via the internet. Subversion is thought of as external interference in a nation's affairs to overthrow the existing order of things. It's an outside-in process, whereas sedition is internal dissent, inciting rebellion against a constituted authority in a state. Now, the way I sort of think about this lesson is more regarding echo chambers and filter bubbles, how the information suggested to us only shows us part of the story and to suit our worldview. And it's important to know that we shouldn't retreat into our own bubbles. And I didn't really have a solution, or the book doesn't really have a solution for how to avoid getting into a bubble. So I think it's more about being aware that you probably are in a bubble already. I mean, if you're watching this video, you've definitely fallen into some sort of bubble. (laughs) But it's a good bubble. But yes, you should break it. Because um, don't get limited by my worldview. That's not an intelligent thing to do. So anyway, on that weird ending point, what have I learnt from this book and what are my key take-homes? Well, in general, I found this book quite dense and I obviously left out a lot of detail. But the interesting thing about this book, well, the funny thing actually, is that ultimately I don't think it explains how spies think because for them, I think they've done it and practised it so many times that it sort of comes naturally to them. So they don't really think about it They're not thinking about their thinking, they just sort of do it. But my main take home from this book is that as humans we are flawed and bound to make bad decisions at times, but we can reduce this by realising these facts and taking the time and putting in the effort to be more considerate about how we come across information and how others feel and think and use that to form our own opinions, which will ultimately make us more intelligent. It's all about conscious and deliberate effort. And then one of my favourite parts of the book was the ethical rule that you should also apply, which is, when in doubt, do the right thing. I know we don't often know what the right thing is, and maybe it won't work out as well if we do the right thing, but you can defend yourself in the knowledge that you tried and you tried to do the right thing. So you know what the right thing to do now is? Subscribe and watch this video here. (laughs) But joking aside, if you want to learn more about intelligence at different biological levels, then you should watch this video here. Otherwise, thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.